Great, thank you, Carol. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Scott. He is a, a very good friend and colleague. Uh, we got to work together for 10 years. And uh, I think a lot of you know him. Uh, he was the uh, moderator for uh, the NatureNet for 20 years. He's been the president of Boulder County Nature Association, and he's been the president of uh, Boulder County Audubon Society. He also has put his hat in the ring running for president in the upcoming elections. So something to consider. We're very pleased about that. Um, on, uh, on a more personal note, I had a chance to ask him some questions I'd never asked him in the 15 or more years I've known him, which is how he got interested in insects. So he had a grandmother who read to him and she read him a book called We Like Bugs and it must have had a big impact. So all you teachers out there and all you people who read to young kids, uh, take note. He started his interest in fourth grade um, because he had a science teacher who really uh, seems to have been a good one who had an insectarium. And in middle school, Scott won uh, science fair projects on bugs and detritivores. Uh, is starting around the early 2000s, he started to notice uh, the insects more. And with the advent of uh, digital photography and digital macro photography, and many of you may know the course that he taught on dragonflies, Odonata. So without further ado, uh, let's hear from Scott and I'll turn it over to you, Scott. Go for it. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay, we're on. We're uh, in a downpour right now in Longmont, so uh, hopefully it's not too uh, noisy. Um, but uh, uh, thank you, Karen, for that really nice introduction. Um, uh, many of you I know were inspired by your moms and your grandmothers and your dads and your grandfathers growing up, uh, and maybe a friend or someone else. And that's sort of my, where the inspiration for this talk came from. So let me go ahead and uh, get us going. So can everybody see my screen? Great. So um, I, I titled this talk, The Other Bugs, because we usually uh, focus uh, a lot in nature on um, some charismatic bugs, things like butterflies, dragonflies, and moths. But uh, I thought, well, you know, when I'm out uh, looking around at these things, I notice a lot of the other things, like the lovely milkweed beetle here. So why bugs? Um, well, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to some of the less studied bugs in our natural history pursuits. Um, look at their incredible biodiversity and varied lifestyles. Um, my area of focus is Colorado, although you can go with lots of different places uh, to see insects. And just their general accessibility, you can just step out your back door, uh, head down to the local trail uh, or your open space. I remember once with my partner, Julie, we were waiting to uh, get into a venue on Main Street uh, and a giant bug landed near somebody and I had to calm this woman down so she didn't squish this giant ichneumon wasp that was about this long. Uh, but it was pretty amazing. So tonight's outline, we're going to just look at some of the orders of other insects. Uh, I'm going to give you a few camera tips um, and some garden tips and some resources. So what are we going to look at tonight? Um, so this is sort of the insect phylogeny or family tree. And I'm going to focus tonight on these five groups. Um, and I was going to work on spiders, but I thought that might push the program too long. So guess what, Beast Boulder Audubon program speakers, you have another talk that I can give. Um, but we're going to focus on grasshoppers, true bugs, bees and wasps, beetles and flies. So let's first, we'll jump right into the grasshoppers, the order Orthoptera. 
which means straight, and wings. Uh, uh, ortho, which is straight, and terra, which is wings. And these are the things like crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids. Uh, there are about 1,200 species in North America, and many of these are our lovely insect singers, especially from midsummer on. And they have these wonderfully strong hind legs for jumping, as you can see in all three of these critters. So the main group that we most likely know of the Orthoptera, the grasshoppers, um, our biggest grasshopper in North America, the plains lover, maybe our most colorful grasshopper in uh, North America, the rainbow grasshopper, and one of my favorite grasshoppers that you can find in sunflower crops um, and sunflower um, Burges in the eastern Colorado, the showy grasshopper with these lovely pink and green legs. But the other groups of Orthoptera uh, are the crickets and the singers of the bug world, uh, such as tree crickets, which you can, uh, the snowy tree cricket, which you can tell the temperature from, and true crickets, which have just started singing. Um, the spring field cricket, and then we have fall field crickets, and we have a group of about four little tiny crickets called brown crickets that start singing about mid-July that I always listen for. And then there's also the katydids, such as this uh, shieldback katydid or the Mormon cricket, um, the meadow katydids, which are really common in marshes. And the angle-winged katydid, which is often found in our fig trees and gardens um, about midsummer on, they make sort of this clicking noise as they uh, get going. Well, let's move on to the Hemoptera, which is the sort of the half-winged uh, insect. These, these insects, such as this uh, box elder bug on the left have sort of a half leathery and half membranous wing and hence that name and that group is made up of the true bugs um and then the other big group of the the hema the hemip hemiptera are the cicadas there's about 10,200 species in north america they're generally soft winged and soft bodied insects and uh, generally all of them have piercing mouth parts, whether that is to pierce into the stem of a um, plant in order to extract sap and other juices, or to pierce for a um, prey item, such as another insect. Uh, a lot of these species are predatory. Some of the notable ones uh, that we have around here are the, this uh, amazing Halloween colored large milkweed bug, which you can find on swamp milkweed especially. Uh, over on the far right are the stink bugs, which will release kind of a, a malodorous scent if you try to handle them. And uh, they generally focus on uh, tree um, plant saps and they do occasionally some of there is a spiny stink bug that will eat other insects and then one of my very favorites uh, is the masked hunter now I still uh, need to find a, and get a photo of their uh, larval or their instar stage which is this little funny bit of fuzz that will walk um, in the basement and it looks like a piece of walking fuzz. Well, it's basically where this insect got its name, the mass hunter. It has stuck little bits of lint and dirt on its back to hide itself. And it will um, catch and eat spiders and other insects that might accidentally get into the house. So that's the mass hunter. And this is the adult. And um, they often come to lights at night and you definitely don't want to handle these. They can, from what I've heard, 
I haven't tried it and I won't will, they will give you a, a nasty bite. Well, then there's also the other sort of big group of true bugs, and that's the cicadas. And these are some of the favorite ones I found, such as the bush cicada out in the plains of Colorado and Wyoming. The one common around town, generally from the end of June through August and September, is the plains harvest fly. Uh, it's about the big as your thumb, or long as your thumb, maybe even a little longer. And they give a very pleasant call and often a chorus. And generally, these insects, unlike the grasshoppers, which are stridulating um, their wings against each other, against a, a series of teeth, and that's what gives the grasshoppers and Katie did their sound, these have little drums that they're um, pulsing in the in the bottom of their abdomens and then this very tiny cicada from southeast colorado called the cactus dodger uh, i just love the names of these guys they're so really funny so this cactus dodger will often be found around uh, choya and uh, making a really uh, dry buds on the hottest days that uh, the year. That's often what you can hear down in southeast Colorado. Well, let's move briefly on to the Hymenoptera. And these are our uh, ants, native bees, and wasps. I didn't include ants in this discussion because I just don't know enough about them. So I didn't really want to present too much about them. Uh, but there's generally 18,000 species of these um, native bees and wasps in North America. I decided not to say much about honeybees because we know already a lot about them. It's the most studied insect in the world. So, uh, But I wanted to focus a little more on our native bees and wasps because they're actually better pollinators than honeybees for our native plants. And they also have a lot more fascinating lifestyles and they just need a lot more attention and care than honeybees do. Um, they have both social and solitary lifestyles and they're incredibly diverse, being pollinators, predators, and parasitic. Um, boy, you name it, they have just about any lifestyle. Almost uh, every native bee has a corresponding uh, parasitic bee that lives with it. Um, maybe just taking a few of the um, native bee uh, larvae in order to survive. Um, and then there's this, um, this is, this in fact here on the right is a uh, male bumblebee waiting for a passing female um, in order to mate with her. And over here on the right is a sand wasp, often nicknamed a horse guard. And uh, they will often hover above horses and jump out and catch a fly on the wing that might be coming to the horse. And so they got this uh, name, the horse guard. And they'll take that fly to a sandy burrow and bury it and uh, to feed their um, nest of larvae as they uh, develop. And so there's a great diversity of these native bees. Um, some of them, uh, like these longhorn bees, sunflower bees, and cuckoo bees. Cuckoo bees, again, another species that might parasitize. I think it actually parasitizes the longhorn bee. And these are all uh, taken in my yard, except for the sunflower bee, which is from Eastern Colorado. All really beneficial and pollinators. And then wasps. Um, wasps has a, have a very diverse lifestyle and they generally, um, I like to sort of do some wasp PR because 
they're generally not going to sting you unless you really push them. Um, this here is a male yellow jacket with his very long antenna, um, probably looking for a mate in late fall. In the center is this little uh, chalk sid wasp, um, which is a, a parasitic wasp. And then over here on the far right is a bee wolf. And uh, it's a pretty fascinating insect that actually will hunt other bees and uh, uh, fashion its nest or load its nest with bees that it's um, uh, killed and, and uh, provisioned with its nest. But uh, my garden's very small. I go in and out of it all day and we have many different wasps species and they just ignore us and we ignore them and generally they're not a problem. So then let's go into the coleoptera, which are the sheath winged or the beetles, basically. Um, basically, that is a reference to this hard shell accessory wing that overlaps or um, serves sort of a protective coat over their inner wings, which they use to fly with. And even some of their uh, outer wings, this sheath, are sometimes used to help them fly. Um, but that's sort of what gives these beetles their characteristic shape and color and hardness to their shell, these hard elytra or these sheaths over their flying wings underneath. They are the largest order of uh, life in Animalia with nearly 39, uh, 390,000 described species around the world and 25,000 species and more every day being discovered in North America. There are many colorful species such as this uh, flower longhorn beetle here on the right. Um, and a lot of them, or the great majority of the adults and even the larvae, have these strong chewing mouth parts, um, such as this uh, warrior beetle, which hunts uh, grubs and caterpillars uh, down on the floor, forest floor. And they also have those strong chewing mouth parts for uh, plants and prey. Um, many of us, um, unfortunately, have encountered the uh, Japanese beetles, which can um, chew down a plant very quickly. So, But here's some of our lovely native uh, beetles. The rainbow, rainbow scarab uh, is uh, what I like to consider sort of the rhinoceros of the beetle world. And it has this lovely rainbow uh, elytra and thorax and even part of the head the thorax being the middle part there. And uh, it's actually a dung beetle. So it will actually, um, if you're familiar with dung beetles, they uh, work together as a pair or as a single individual, find some uh, dung from a deer or an elk or a cattle, and they'll make it, fashion it into a ball. They'll go and bury it in the ground and they'll lay an egg into it. And that is the food for their, um, their larva. And um, so rainbow scarabs are our, probably our most care, um, colorful uh, dung beetle in North America. Uh, over on the right um, is the tiger beetle, the blowout tiger beetle, which um, refers to its occurrence in sand dune blowouts in western North America and in the plains of Colorado and up into the sand dunes um, or the sand hills of Nebraska. Uh, one of my very fav favorite groups of beetles. I have yet to see the great sand dunes tiger beetle. Um, I would love to try to find that sometime. If you've seen it, drop me a note in the chat. I'd love to see or hear if you've seen one. And then this very delicate and interesting creature, this net winged beetle. Um, it has some more soft elytra on its back, um, and it uh, tends to um, have larvae that forage on um, mushroom spores and mycelium in the ground. Uh, 
Well, uh, so flies. People might think, well, Scott, why are you going to talk about flies? Well, flies are really incredibly diverse and interesting insects. Um, uh, and actually quite important pollinators. And they have incredibly diverse lifestyles and histories. They're important predators. They're important in the breakdown of uh, carrion and dying and dead animals. Uh, they're also important um, predators uh, and, and parasitic of other creatures. So they're very fascinating. They're incredibly diverse. There's never, nearly uh, 17,000 species in North America. Um, I don't know if I have a good picture of this, but they have this amazing thing called halters, which are behind the main wings. They have these little, little balls. Uh, they're like little balls on the end of stems. And they actually uh, serve as balance. And they, you'll see them move around as they're flying and keep, they keep them their balance. Um, it's called a halter. So here we have a drone fly, which actually is probably, uh, this might be an imported drone fly here on the left, that is actually a honeybee mimic. And you can almost look at its rear abdomen, and it almost superficially looks like a honeybee abdomen. So that might help it being uh, help it be prevented from being preyed upon by a predatory bird or, or something. Uh, and then here a green bottle fly, which is nearly cosmopolitan in its distribution around the world. And this is uh, important um, in its larval stage. It's important at, in its breakdown of carrion and um, dead and dead uh, animals around the world. Well, here's some other very diverse creatures, uh, robber flies, which are incredibly amazing um, predators with that very sharp beak uh, at the front of its uh, head, which it will, um, I've seen them subdue prey much larger than themselves, such as grasshoppers and uh, even take on things like dragonflies and tiger beetles. These guys are pretty fierce and they generally hunt by ambush. And we have some really excellent diversity of robber flies, especially on the Colorado Kansas border and down into the canyon country of Southeast Colorado. Uh, I highly urge you to watch out for them. They're ex incredibly interested. And if you would like to know more um, about robber flies specifically, I can give you a good website with some fantastic um, leads for Colorado species. And then uh, let's talk about the guy over on the far right, the hedgehog fly, which you can see generally from about mid uh, July through August through the fall up in our mountain canyons and foothills, especially along riparian areas. Uh, this is a tachnid, a tachnid fly. Um, this is often parasitic on butterflies and other insects in the larval stage. Um, and again, uh, in balance, a tachinid fly may not be a problem for butterflies. In a world out of balance, maybe tachinids might provide be a problem for butterfly conservation. Uh, but tachinids are really interesting and diverse, and they're very good pollinators as you might attest to with this really hairy tachnid fly. And then the middle are midges. There's a midge with this lovely feathery antenna. And midges often are mistaken for mosquitoes in the springtime. Uh, they often hilltop on the top of your head because they're looking for the highest place on the trail to find a mate. And you happen to be the highest object on the trail and they're finding each other in order to uh, find a mate, uh, in order to uh, mate and go uh, lay their eggs in a, a, a swampy area. And then they produce these very interesting red wiggly worms down in the soil. And they're really important foods, both um, in that stage for aquatic, um, these aquatic larvae are important foods for ducks, shorebirds, um, and 
uh, other birds that might forage along the shoreline. And then as adults, of course, this is a really important food for um, insective, insect, uh, fly catching birds, um, uh, like fly catchers, warblers, and of course bats. And um, so midges, and the midges come in all sorts of different uh, colors and interesting shapes. So I really find midges, midges quite interesting. There are biting midges and there are of course mosquitoes. Um, again, the diversity of flies is, is just incredible. So again, diptera, two wings. So let's just talk briefly about um, some camera tips. Um, if you are doing digital these days, I really recommend trying a macro lens. Um, this is uh, sort of uh, my setup here, um, an Olympus camera with a macro lens and a, um, a ring flash which is, helps sort of um, get good light on that insect and in close quarters. And then try using, especially for small, uh, smaller insects, if they're not really fast moving, try uh, aperture priority on your camera. Uh, instead of shutter priority, which is meant for speed, aperture priority is built for giving you the best depth of field. And if, if you aim for around F, eight or nine, larger if you want to, up to F12 or 14 or so, um, the larger, the higher the number, the better aperture you're going to get and the more of the insect's um, body you're going to get in your field of view. If you wanted to take it one step further, your camera might have a feature called focus stacking, which will actually look at, uh, take very quickly a sequential snapshot of the insect at different um, layers of the insect from head to tail, so to speak. And it will then, um, so it'll take one image at the head and then it'll take a second image right slightly behind the head and one through the thorax, one through the abdomen and one through the tail. And then it'll combine those images um, it'll even do it in camera, but you can do this also on your computer. It will combine those images into one complete image and you'll have a focus stacked image and the image, the, the insect will be sharp from, from the eyes all the way to the, the end of the abdomen. It's really fun. Um, and again, I mentioned ring flashes are really good for low light, uh, especially for photographing insects that might come to your porch at night. So garden tips. Please, please, please grow native plants if you can. These are things like milkweeds and sunflowers, native composites, penstemons. Grow native plants. You will get a lot more interesting uh, insects in your garden if you can do natives. Um, and you'll actually see uh, fewer of the insects that like to eat your garden because uh, uh, generally Japanese beetles aren't super keen on native plants um, and uh, neither are some of the other introduced insects generally aren't as interested in uh, native plants. Um, then when you're uh, growing your garden, at the end of the season, uh, let your plants overwinter in, in their in entirety. The stems, the flowers, the leaves. Don't clean up your garden in the fall. Um, leave those plants overwinter because you actually have native bees and eggs and um, next year's insects in the flowers and stems for next year. And if you clean your, up your garden, if you cut it all back and you um, compost those things, you're basically composting next year's insects. So leave that until um, after frost and then cut it back. Then you can cut back your plants so that they can, the new growth, new growth can progress and maybe leave those that last year's growth over on the side of your garden somewhere so that the um, new, the old 
or the old growth can um, let the insects come out and they'll find their um, new plants and insect, uh, uh, flowers in which to survive on. And then of course, limit and or don't use pesticides um, as much as possible and you'll have a much better garden and uh, much more in better insect diversity in your garden um, if you can do that. So here are some of my favorite plants. And uh, one of them is the field sunflower, just the roadside sunflower. And we've uh, let that go in our garden, much to the chagrin of Julie, because sometimes it takes over. So uh, I make sure I make a promise with her to pull all the other ones and we keep two or three and that's plenty. Um, our garden is only about 10 by 10 and just two or three plants. Um, and they, it's amazing. I think the goldfinches will have gotten all the seeds and they just reseed anyway. And I still get hundreds of plants uh, starting anew the next year. So you just, they're really easy to pull and you just pick a few of the hardier looking ones. And that will be your, um, your beast, your insectarium for next summer because the native sunflowers, I don't think there's another plant that has more insects on it than native sunflowers. Um, uh, rabbit brush, if you have room, rabbit brush is a huge magnet, especially for moths and butterflies and beetles. Uh, oh, and, and pollinators, bees and all, all kinds of insects. So that's a really good one as well. Curly cup gumweed. This is um, uh, one of the plants that you will see uh, commonly uh, at the roadside margins. It has these delicate little um, yellow flowers with a, on the base of a bright green with these recurved bracts that look like little curls. I'll show you one here in a moment. But that is a great plant. Um, it's easy, to, it grows everywhere and the pollinators and the uh, different insects really, really love it. Of course, milkweeds. Here I have a um, a picture here on the right of a swamp milkweed with, uh, this looks like maybe one of the uh, cricket hunting wasps on it, uh, maybe a spider hunting wasp. Um, but these wasps, um, uh, a lot of these wasps, um, their food for themselves is nectar and their food for their upcoming brood is uh, spiders and grasshoppers. So um, here, this female is just enjoying her, um, or maybe it's, I think this is a male. This male is just enjoying um, uh, the swamp milkweed in which to forage on. And we got some swamp milkweed this year for our garden um, from uh, the flower bin in Longmont. So we're looking forward to seeing if we can get it to grow. Uh, snow on the mountain. Um, that is our one of our native euphorbias or um, it's, it's like a poinsettia. Um, and uh, again, you want to be somewhat careful and judicious with it. It could take over a garden in some cases. I think that's more of a problem further east. Um, but oh boy, do the pollinators uh, love and all these uh, insects that um, are uncommon to our garden um, really love snow on the mountain. And then Finally, alliums, wild onions. Um, even if you do herbs, you could do uh, garlic chives. Um, uh, just make sure that they uh, uh, don't become invasive. Um, double check on that and make sure it's a good plant for your garden. But uh, wild onions, uh, really the, the, uh, the uh, insects love those a lot. So we'll just kind of go around the top, starting on the top left, we have a native wasp on a rabbit brush. And in the center here is this roadside sunflower with uh, in the center of the plant is a soldier beetle, that orange guy, and a couple of native uh, blister beetles down underneath. And look at that uh, up on that corner. Uh, of the sunflower, a crab spider that's matched the color, hoping for an insect to stumble into those legs in which to catch it. And then up here on the far upper right-hand corner 
This is broom snakeweed. Um, I didn't mention that on the, but that is a lovely pollinator plant. And this is actually a native beetle that is um, that specifically um, focuses on broom snakeweed. I think it's like a broom snakeweed beetle. <laughs> and um, so broom snakeweed is a lovely pollinator plant. Down here on the lower left-hand corner, that's curly cup gumweed with a couple of flower a longhorn beetles mating on it and eating pollen. And then we have a thread waisted wasp in the center here on some uh, chives. And then one of my favorite photos is this uh, on this uh, lower right hand corner. Um, if you look closely, there's a pair of scarab beetles facing each other. This is a roadside sunflower. And these beetles are getting um, sap from the uh, one of the stems, but the, also the um, leaves of sunflowers about halfway down the stem have these little um, extra floral nectarines. They're these little slots or stem cuts where the uh, insects can actually come and get um, uh, a meal from, it's just another way for the plant to attract um, insects to help it get pollinated, and they have these extra floral nectaries on the stems. It might attract a, an insect that might help provide protection against maybe an a insect that might eat the leaves. But here we have these two scarab beetles uh, working on this stem. This native paper wasp is coming in, um, actually had actually lapped the juice coming out from those beetles. And same with the little fly on the left-hand side. And then behind the stem is a soldier beetle. So they're all taking advantage of this uh, sunflower. And the sunflower just keeps growing and doesn't, uh, isn't any worse for wear. Um, so what a zoo of insects at that photo. And then um, just go through some more, uh, a swamp milkweed on the left here with a sand beetle uh, or a sand wasp taking a nice snack. And this group here on the far right is a group of um, banded wasps, um, again, on the extra floral nectaries of sunflower. Uh, this, I think these are all males and they're just uh, lapping up the, the sap. Um, and these males will, probably roost together later at night at dusk uh, as a form of protection. A lot of wasps, will, uh, male wasps, will roost together at night uh, as a safety defense. And then finally in the middle is snow on the mountain. Um, you'll notice that the main flowers where the soldier beetle is foraging are in the center of the flower. And then these are actually like a poinsettia, modified leaves to the out to the side of the flowers that have this lovely white margins and green centers. And if I'm out uh, working in Eastern Colorado or out going out on a field trip, I will pull over at um, both um, stands of uh, roadside sunflower and stands of these roadside patches of um, snow on the mountain and of course milkweed. And then, then another plant that's really quite fascinating that gets a lot of cool bugs are our native buffalo gourds out on the roadsides in eastern Colorado. So definitely, if they're in bloom, stop at the um, and look for gourd plants. So let's go through some of the resources. Um, uh, these are some of my favorites, uh, starting on the upper right hand or upper left hand, um, written by uh, Whitney Cranshaw and Boris Contralief as uh, the Guide to Colorado Insects, uh, a great introduction to just the very common insects and bugs around Colorado. And it has spiders too and arachnids. And another really excellent book, um, has a good diversity of insects in it, is the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. It's really good and straightforward information. I really enjoy both of those books. 
Uh, over on the right hand side is a new addition to insects um, in our local area and that's this uh, insect and kin of the Colorado Front Range. And this is a lovely volume. Um, uh, I probably wouldn't recommend it if you just have a casual interest in bugs, but if you're a naturalist, this would be a great book to have to your library. Um, and it's hefty. It's like the old phone books, um, if you remember those. Um, really solid book, and um, you could knock out a, you know, somebody trying to get into your house with it. It's that has that much information in it, um, and it's just lovely. It has a great diversity of insects written by Lynn and Jean Monroe, who lived up near Lyons for many years, and their love of insects um, took them and to this far, and they developed this great book, and I think we'll eventually we'll have them as speakers, um, and it's a fantastic book, and it will cover more than just the front range. It will cover almost a lot of Colorado as well, and our own Pam Piambino lent many of her photos and information to the volume, and uh, Pam, I'm not sure if, of the books or how many are still left. Maybe you could drop a note in the chat to let us know how many might be left or if they can still order from you. And then finally, um, uh, one of the, the place where I really got started when I started getting a, an adult interest in bugs is the bug guide. This was iNaturalist before iNaturalist. And in fact, iNaturalist still refers to bug guide um, for information. And I love iNaturalist too, but if you want to go to all things bugs, um, this is a fantastic guide. It's hosted at the uh, Iowa State University. Uh, you can drop um, IDs and quests in there, and then you can also contribute. Um, if you have a, generally they want really high quality photos for their library, so don't be upset if your uh, photo might get what they call frassed and <laughs> sent to the um, uh, garbage bin. If that happens, just put it on iNaturalist. But this is a great online guide to all the insects. Um, and it's got the clickable, clickable guide there on the right. And you can kind of click the uh, shape or insect. Uh, it's all out laid out by taxonomy. And it's just an excellent resource for insects. Well, because I didn't want to go on too long, I decided to leave the spiders and arachnids off the talk tonight so we would have time for questions. So, um, like I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, arachnids for naturalists will be covered in a future program. Um, and at that point, maybe I'll have learned a little more to make it an even better program. But I wanted just to leave some time for questions and and. Uh, or just observations that you've had. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to thank my partner, Julie Bartlett, which uh, she puts up with me and she loves bugs too. She took entomology in college and uh, I borrow a lot of her old entomology books and uh, she uh, deals with me sitting out on the porch at night, seeing what might have come to our lights. Of course, uh, Pam, uh, who shares my love of insects and bugs and has invited me uh, many times to come mothing with her and uh, enjoy bugs. And then Steve Jones, who uh, is my mentor in naturalists and uh, wildlife biology. And Ann Cooper, who's also a friend and mentor in naturalists. And then um, Kathy Comstock, who her infectious enthusiasm for in that enthusiasm for uh, dragonflies and bugs and other things really get, keeps me going to get back out there and to have you on a few field trips. So uh, with that, um, we can open it up to questions and um, I'll try to answer them the best I can. If I don't know them, I'll save it in the chat and uh, try to get you an answer. Um, by the way, this is a small milkweed bug um, that spent the winter, is getting ready to spend the winter in our garden. So. Well, Scott, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it, it's great. I've always enjoyed looking at bugs, but you know, 
with with birds, I have you know ten to eleven thousand that I in the world that I need to keep track of, and with bugs, it's you know that many in this state and the surrounding area. And so um, I really appreciate the what you talked about the the references and how to get into it. So we already have a few questions. So I'll hold my question off till the end. Um, a few things, uh, just comments before I get to the questions. Paul Hansley mentioned that. Physaria bellii is one of her favorite plants, uh, native plants that people are really interested in. That. I think that's one of the twin pods. Yeah. Um, and despite the drought that it's doing beautifully this spring. Um, Pam mentions that there are maybe six or so left of the insects and kin on Amazon. Um, it was only a 250 uh, copy run this first time. So if that's interesting to you, and I, I actually pulled mine out during the talk and was kind of referencing as I was listening. Um, so get on that ASAP if any of you in the audience are, are wanting, to, wanting to get a copy of this. It is quite a tome. Yeah. Uh, and then, so the first question from Karen, can you remind us of the difference between bees and wasps? Oh, that's a good question. Well, generally bees tend to have a, one of the major differences that bees tend to have a lot of um, uh, hairs, guard hairs on their body and wasps tend not to. Um, uh, but you can't say, uh, you can't really say anything about their stingers. Not all bees um, sting and neither do all, neither do all wasps. Uh, sting. So, but mainly, I think it's uh, mostly that the the wasps uh, generally have more uh, are generally less have less hairs on guard hairs on their bodies. Especially. Don't the wasps also have a really narrow uh, waist? Yes, yes, that's a good that's a good point, John. Definitely. Yeah. I think there are some behavioral and maybe diet differences as well. Yes in general between wasps and yeah there's um there's not many bees that are predaceous on other insects but wasps um very much are um uh, in fact i don't think there's a i can't think there's well except for bees that uh parasitize and prey on other bees so um from greg Lewandowski, we have what are your thoughts on european paper wasps bad for lepidoptera <laughs> Or other native pollinators, best to remove nests. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of um, uh, opinions on that. Unfortunately, I live in a place where it'd be almost impossible to get rid of them all. They are they are a profound influence on native uh, Lepidoptera. So um, I would suggest if you live especially near good butterfly habitat that you might um, you might want to remove those from your garden, uh, especially if you're trying to cultivate or grow butterflies in your garden, um, because these guys are voracious predators, um, uh, not only on um, uh, Lepidoptera, but they will also go through your garden and eat every spider that they can find. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, uh, in terms of a, um, again, um, European paper wasps are here because of people. So I don't, I don't consider, I don't really consider any animal evil. Um, usually they're the, the uh, process where we put a value on a critter and give it a designation of, of evil or terrible or um Put the take out the mirror and say who actually brought this here. So um, that's where the problem comes. It's with introdu introductions, but um, the insects themselves aren't evil. Um, paper wasps um, uh, are they get confused a lot, and I'll sometimes need to do a graphic for maybe the Audubon website. They do get confused. Both our native um, paper wasps. And the European paper wasps get confused for yellow jackets. And yellow jackets, in this in the situation where they're defending their nest, can be extremely 
um, defensive and and uh, repulsive. So do be very careful of, around yellow jackets, which tend to either nest in a very large globe nest up in high in a tree or in the ground. There's sort of two groups. Um, so when I had a when we had ground uh, ground uh, yellow jackets near our house, um, I usually took the dog on a big loop around them to keep away from their defensive window, which is usually at the first three or four feet around the ground nest. Paper wasps, I can pick them up and move them to another plant and they won't sting you. They're very docile, even the native ones. But if you are allergic, don't handle them, of course. I wonder if you could mention anything about the difference in the nests between the native paper wasps and the, the European ones, if you're recommending people remove them from their gardens. Uh, I would learn the species first. Um, the uh, European paper wasp is really brightly black and yellow, um, and the nest is generally um, open, uh, doesn't have a paper covering. Um, the native Paper wasps are generally shades of orange, black, and yellow. Um, uh, not as black, not and and brown and brown. Um, but uh, if you have one, take a photo of it and send it to me. I'll tell you. Um, but the paper wasps are really common, and maybe I'll put that in our little ID guide. You can definitely Google it. Um, uh, European paper wasps, there's lots of photos of them as well. I don't see many pa native paper wasps around our homes, unless you live out in the country uh, or near um, open space, you may not see many native paper wasps. Um, there's a few compliments on your fantastic photos. Oh, thank you. Um, and also, uh, thanks for talking about the other thing. Pam Piombino has asked me to, since we're talking about native plants and the importance of native plants to uh, insects and native insects, that the Colorado Native Plant Society garden tour is happening, coming up here soon. Um, Pam said it's June 4th, and I think there's actually a couple different dates depending on kind of what garden tours and which areas you're looking for. Um, so if you're interested in native plants, um, and how to incorporate those into your gardens. Look up the Colorado Native Plant Society uh, and the upcoming garden tour. Um, John made a comment about the invasive species um, as well, about them maybe not necessarily being invasive, but instead misplaced relatives. <laughs> um, and from Larry, any comments on the Western conifer seed bugs? One of their favorite uninvited house guests every fall <laughs> in South Boulder. Uh, my mom, when she was still around, uh, she would vacuum them out of her house because <laughs> they came in. They are amazing. They in the fall, these Western Western conifer seed bugs, which is a leaf-footed bug. Um, they're about the size of. Uh, Oh, they're about an inch long and they have this really interesting smell. They smell kind of like pineapple. And then at the, at the bottom of their uh, hind legs, they have this little leaf um, that, that shows up. They're really interesting, cool shapes. Um, and they like to come in like a lot of the uh, uh, true bugs, like box elder bug and stink bugs and this leaf-footed bug, or the western conifer seed bug as it's known, they like to come in and winter in your home. So they will definitely, they can be contracted out to your um, uh, handyman and help you find uh, places that you might have uh, gaps in your foundation or your um, siding so you can insulate better. So I would say check your insulation. You might be losing precious heat and insulation out window, but they do like to come in. I remember um, the old owner of Mountain Sports on West Pearl Street, um, one of the original mountain stores in Boulder. Uh, he had a box elder tree right next to the building. And I used to work at the Wild Bird Center across the shop and um, Bob would come out, uh, get a ladder and climb up on the roof and he would vacuum 
all the box elder bugs off the tree because they would come into mountain sports from his ceiling and he'd get uh, box elder bugs all over the ceiling. So, um, so they do like to get in the house, definitely, as, as for shelter in the fall. And I think we covered Janet's or Chu's question about the difference in paper wasps. And we just got a new question about any information about the green lacy wings. Oh, yeah, lace wings. I uh, forgot to include a photo of those. They're lovely insects. Um, and they're really beneficial because they like to eat aphids, uh, both as adults and as, um, but especially as uh, larvae. They have these little cool little spiny little larva with these pinchers on the as mandibles and they'll go and um oh there's my boss <laughs> he missed the program um, <laughs> um so they'll pinch they'll pinch uh things like aphids and then suck them dry and they'll work in your garden and uh the adults will lay these eggs on these little um filaments with a little balloon of an egg on the top, and it's really beautiful. So look for those on in your garden. And if you see that little filament with a little balloon on the top, that's a lacewing egg. And there's lots of different species. They generally have these coppery red eyes and green lacewing bodies. They're really lovely insects, and they come to light at night. I would recommend um, after you enjoy the bugs at night and for the bird's sake, please turn your lights off because we want those bugs to go back out into the wild. And at night, they're looking for mates and your light is confusing them. So if at all possible, please turn your lights out at night, um, both for the sake of migratory birds, but also for the sake of insects trying to find their life's partner um, or mate at that time of year, or at this time of year. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for that. Um, oh, I've got one more that just came in. Uh, I have from Bev Baker. I have found a couple of individual, very lethargic paper wasps indoors in early spring and use the insect tome to ID them as European based on the antenna color. Oh, okay, great. And thanks you for the, the talk. So if you're trying to figure out those European paper wasps, check out the antenna color um, on that. I'm going to if anyone wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, we could do that really quickly. I'm not hearing anything. So thank you very much, Scott. That was fascinating. It's also thank a you, everybody. time of the year for this talk. So we can all go out and put this into practice. Thank you. And I hope you have a good night. And for everyone else on the meeting, um, there are not programs throughout the summer, so we will be seeing everyone, each other, either in person or over Zoom in the hybrid meeting uh, in September. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.